And we are live. Right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our June 24th meeting of the Chiefs Advisory Committee. Um, this uh, has been obviously a navigation for all of us as we've worked through the uh, requirements for uh, addressing the safety and health protocols during the uh, COVID pandemic. And so, uh, again, appreciate everybody joining in a virtual format today. And um, this may be the last time uh, we, we hold this meeting in a virtual format. So as we move forward, the uh, opportunity to hold virtual public meetings ends on July 1st. So our meeting in July, um, we can talk about later during the meeting how we're, or where we're going to hold that, uh, but we will be back in person or in person for all of us um, for the first time which will be an exciting opportunity. But welcome everybody to the meeting tonight. I know we have a full agenda and with, uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to our chairs, uh, Judge Dwayne Maynard and Ms. Ajmeri Hawk. All right, thank you, Chief. And thank you to everyone who's in attendance at this, our 10th virtual CAC meeting. Uh, obviously it's a beautiful evening and as I checked the temperature, it was in the mid 80s. So we should acknowledge that being in front of a screen on such a beautiful evening is a sacrifice. But one that I hope that you all uh, continue to believe is a worthwhile sacrifice to make as we continue to work, as we continue the work of building bridges that connects the Dublin Police Department with a very diverse communities and constituencies, it has been sworn to serve and protect. As always between uh, meetings, there has been a great deal that has transpired. Um, interestingly, uh, from my perspective, the dichotomy between having a uh, new holiday uh, past in seemingly record time by Congress and then signed into law by the president. And yet uh, little activity or movement on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which um, is part of the backdrop of how we're here as the Chief's Advisory Committee. So uh, I'm gonna ask that um, Although there isn't much movement on the national level that we continue to make uh, movement uh, on the local level. Chief, I, I know that it has been a, an interesting month from your vantage point because we have a new police chief and an assistant or deputy police chief in Columbus. And we have a new uh, acting police chief in Hilliard since the last time that we met with them apparently moving to find a deputy police chief who can become the chief within a year. So all of a sudden, you're one of the, the sage wise chiefs in the region. <laughs> um, but certainly uh, all of us on the committee are glad that uh, you're our chief. So. I'm going to hand the, unless as Jamiri, you have some opening comments, I'm going to hand it back over to the chief so that we can move through the agenda and uh, taking of attendance. Chief. Very good, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I will call attendance. Uh, Judge, our chair, Judge Dwayne Maynard. Sorry. Uh, Co chair, Ms. Ajmeri Hawk. Mr. Cameron Justice. Present. Ms. Susan Ortega. Present. Mr. Imran Malik. Present. And Ms. Courtney Ingram. Present. And judges pr at present, uh, Dr. Ganam, uh, Ms. Yenling Yen, uh, Mr. Isao Shoji, and Ms. Stella Vialba. Uh, are not present with us today. I do believe that uh, Mr. Shoji emailed and said he was not going to be able to to uh, attend today. The others may join us uh, as we proceed. Uh, Lieutenant Latanzi, Lieutenant Tabernick, and Director Somerville are here with us 
this evening. And as always, uh, Miss Rebecca Metcalf is taking notes for us this evening. Okay, great. Uh, hello, Cam, Susan, and Courtney. It's good to know that you all are online. I, I haven't been able to see you all. Um, we know that Stella's not coming tonight. We know that uh, Yan Ling is not coming tonight. And if uh, Esau is not coming tonight, the only uh, person that might still check in would be Dr. Gadam. So um, we can move into old business. Oh, and you said Becky's on the line too, taking notes. Yes, Miss Metcalf is uh, is joining us this evening as well. Okay, great. Good evening. Um, the next item on the agenda would be old business. Um, I had hoped that Rebecca Myers would be here. Oh, actually, we had a discussion prior to going live about the review of the minutes from the May meeting. Um, whatever the technical reasons were, we don't have uh, those minutes to review at this time. And um, we've determined that Robert's rules allows us to postpone review and potential adoption of those minutes until our next meeting. And um, unless uh, Director Somerville if I need a motion to do that, I'll entertain it. But otherwise, as the chair, I would uh, make the determination that because we don't have postpone review and adoption until the next me meeting. That would be appropriate, Judge. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, that, that then allows us to move into old business um, and um, Generally, those are topics that um, I asked Rebecca Myers about uh, specifically, but since she's not with us tonight, I'm going to open it up to the committee and ask, are there any old business issues that uh, we need to discuss uh, before moving into the chief's update portion of the meeting? Um, because I can't see you as Mary, I'll ask you first. Nothing on my end. Thank you, Judge. All right, thank you. Imran, uh, I'm gonna ask you second. I'm good, Judge. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Cameron, I'm gonna ask you uh, here next. No, sir, th thank you. Thank you. Susan, uh, anything in old business that you think we need to discuss? Not that I can think of, thank you. All right, thank you. And finally, Courtney, anything in old business that you think that we need to address? I don't believe so. I'm ready to move forward. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Chief, I'm going to ask, um, because it's not on the Chief's update, that you do include some discussion about the police department's uh, recruitment campaign. Um, that I, I believe was mentioned during the course of last month's meeting. And I believe that there are written exams that are, that are going to be taken um, during this coming weekend. So although it's not on your update, if you could give us some information in the course of the update about what I've marked as the Dublin Police Department recruiting campaign, that would be appreciated. Yes, sir, Judge. Uh, yeah, so we did mention last um, meeting that we would have an, uh, a, an upcoming test for police candidacy with our agency, and those uh, tests will be held on Saturday and Sunday at Dublin Scioto High School. Um, and so uh, thank you again for your help and support. I know uh, Rebecca sent uh, some information about the police test upcoming, so if you share that with anyone, certainly I hope to see them at the tests over the weekend, and hopefully um, we'll see them in the future here with us as part of the Dublin Police Department. Uh, so those will be ongoing over the weekend, and that is the starting point for our uh, entry process into our 
uh, or, or to become a candidate here at the Dublin Police Department. The written exam uh, will commence on Saturday and Sunday. We will then score those tests at that time. And then typically what we do is we take the top 30 uh, or we've taken as many as I think up to 60, depending on where the scores fall in for those passing scores. And then we will schedule interviews as the second follow up process for those candidates. So candidates will receive information from our human resources um, business partner to schedule interviews in the future as a second part of that process. Uh, and then after we interview, we will move that group down to a more manageable um, size for our detectives to do a background investigation on those candidates that are at the top of the list coming out of the interview process. Uh, and so that background uh, process is, is relatively extensive and, and we can certainly present a little more detail on that in the future from Lieutenant Tabernick or from any of our background investigators at the agency. Um, but that background investigation would take several months to put together. Those backgrounds would then come to uh, the uh, to the human resources and then come to the bureau commanders and I to, and we would hold final interviews with our command staff and then make ultimately selections for um, the positions that we have to fill as vacancies uh, here at the uh, at the Dublin Police Department. So between the last time uh, we were together and uh, in our meeting tonight, we actually um, brought on two more officers to the agency who have both started at the Columbus uh, Police Academy on uh, Monday, uh, it's two weeks ago, uh, ultimately. So they've been in the academy for a couple of weeks and we're very excited to to have them aboard and look forward to them joining us and starting their field training program uh, when they finish the academy about seven months from now uh, at the beginning of uh, early next year. And Lieutenant Latanzi can talk a little bit about the candidates and that, that process, certainly if we had other questions or information. But again, it all starts with our police tests coming Saturday and Sunday. So I'll be there at Syeda High School to, to greet people as they come and take our test. And uh, and we look forward to, to meeting new candidates and anyone who has any interest uh, in joining our organization. Um, in addition, uh, I know that there was a little bit of news yesterday uh, at the state level. Uh, Governor DeWine uh, mentioned a program on uh, police recruitment and we have mentioned in the past that we are very fortunate to have some connectivity to that ongoing program and office of police recruitment in the state of Ohio uh, through Lieutenant Latanzi's involvement on the advisory board for that uh, office of police recruitment uh, at the state level. Uh, so I, what I would ask is uh, for Lieutenant Latanzi to share just a little bit of information, if he could, about that program that was highlighted in the news yesterday. And we were part of that pre press conference with Governor DeWine to announce that uh, recruitment program. Thanks, Chief, and good evening, uh, members of the advisory committee. Uh, just as the chief said, our recruiting efforts are ongoing. They're year round. Um, so not just uh, in anticipation for our hiring processes. And part of that obviously is our focus on trying to be as inclusive as possible and diversify uh, the agency. And as part of <clears throat> uh, the Ohio Office of Criminal Justice, Justice Services through the state, um, they did develop uh, at the, earlier this, uh, I guess in 2020, um, an office that specifically focused on recruitment of police officers, which uh, really started in culmination uh, yesterday with the governor's announcement of a program called the College to Law Enforcement Academic Program. It is going to begin as a pilot program with Cedarville and Central State Universities. Um, and what this program is designed to do is to get connectivity between college students that are in criminal justice programs connected to law enforcement agencies through mentorship, um, information sessions, and most importantly, preparing them for a career in law enforcement. This program is going to specifically, um, it's going to specifically target uh, minority and female applicants that are interested in this profession. And it is going to run them through a pretty rigorous application um, process to prepare them again for uh, processes like the chief had mentioned in regards to hiring. So for somebody to be accepted into the program, they have to achieve a 3.0 grade point average or better. They have to go through a background process uh, polygraph examination, psychological examination, physical fitness testing, and so on before they're accepted into this program. <clears throat> the reason for that is they are trying to create a pool of candidates that are 
ready to be hired uh, when they finish their degree program. So what that'll do is right now there's a there's 11 uh, participating interested agencies uh, in the state, us in, being included in that group, um, to try to figure out a way to uh, get them to join our agency and create um, ways for us to, to hire those individuals that have completed this program. So we look forward to how that program is gonna evolve over time. Uh, that pilot program is uh, scheduled to begin in the fall. We still have some work to do um, on that committee to uh, finalize all the different aspects of the program, but it's definitely a good start in us trying to seek out um, qualified, diverse candidates to join uh, police ranks in the state. It's um, go ahead. I have a question. Um, and I was just listening, and I don't think I heard this, but maybe it's included. Um, what are the, how do you evaluate their social, emotional skills, awareness of managing their tempers and managing their own stress and all of that? Um, if you could explain that a little bit more. Thanks for the question, Asmiri. Um, part of the way that they're going to do that is, is through that background and polygraph um, and psychological evaluation that they'll get as part of the, um, the process to enter into this program. It's also going to include a interview process with um, members of faculty from those universities and from law enforcement um, to gauge that activity and then ongoing contact throughout this program um, to monitor behaviors and ensure that they're abiding by uh, the core values of the program. And then any violation of such program would be potentially grounds for removal from the program. And all of that would be documented in a almost like a personnel file for these candidates that'll be held by uh, the Office of Law Enforcement and Recruitment um, through OC just as part of their entry into that program to have uh, while they're connected into that program. Thanks for explaining it a little bit more. Uh, no problem, Ashmeri. And just uh, just as as to mention those core values of that program specifically. Our integrity, service, service orientation, human relations skills, team compatibility, performance driven, and self control. So some of those exact things that you mentioned are part of the things that this program is looking to identify in those candidates. And Lieutenant, before you move on, um, can you tell us um, what the makeup of the advisory committee is that you're serving on or the advisory board, if that's more appropriate. Sure, so that committee is, and I don't have all the names in front of me, Judge, I apologize, I can get those to you after the meeting, but it is made up of both law enforcement professionals throughout the state, um, and they have definitely added some diversity into that advisory board. It is um, directed by an officer from the Copley Police Department. Her name is Sarah Shendi. Um, uh, and then one of the main individuals is Dr. Patrick Oliver, who helps um, guide, and he is the director at Cedarville University uh, Criminal Justice Program uh, as part of that group. But there are members from the Highway Patrol, um, <clears throat> University of Dayton Police Department, um, both active and retired individuals from the state highway patrol and then they also have some non-law enforcement um, personnel that are part of that advisory board both from the business sector and from um, diversity equity and inclusion um, consultants as part of that board okay i think that that's um, all very positive and just for the community partners, it's a, a, a wonderful thing that Dublin has the opportunity to impact uh, law enforcement practices throughout the state. So uh, congratulations and we'll, we'll, we'll be keeping touch with you, Lieutenant Latanzi. All right. 
Thank you for the question, Judge. And I just want to again give credit to Lieutenant Latanzi for leaning forward for his initiative and leadership as part of that advisory board. And uh, and certainly, as we can, this is one initiative we wanted to make sure we made the members of the advisory committee aware of. But there are going to be others. I have no doubt that Lieutenant Latanzi will get a chance to to work on, and we'll have an opportunity through our connectivity with the advisory committee to share some thoughts and ideas from right here in Dublin on things that are happening at the state level as well. So thank you again for asking the question. And I just wanted to follow up uh, real quick on uh, um, Ashmeri's question as well, that the, I, I think uh, your question was about um, how do we sort of screen officers coming into that program, but I just wanted to offer as part of our process for the selection of our officers, that background is what would lead up to a conditional offer. After a conditional offer is extended, a medical, psychological, and a polygraph are all parts and components of our process as well. That happen after we extend a conditional offer to a candidate to make sure we validate through all of those other uh, steps that we are making an offer to somebody who is joining us and, and is going to contribute to again, the wonderful service we have here, but also bring their unique perspective and how we protect and serve this community as well. Chief, um, I have a question on that. Just is that typical for most of departments across Ohio or the country, or is that special to Dublin or what does that process always look like? Yeah, process is very, um, but I would say that the uh, polygraph and psychological are, are pretty typical of, of most agencies or organizations. Who they have do that uh, and what that looks like may vary depending on who they have access to to provide those resources. But most agencies in, in a um, full service police department are going to have that as a component of their um, of their selection process for officers. And Lieutenant Tabernick, I saw you shaking your head if there was anything um, different that I missed or if I, uh, if you wanted to add from the background perspective. Can you hear me? All right, sorry, I had some audio issues, so bear with me. I'm calling in right now, so if there's a discrepancy in uh, the picture and the call, I apologize. Um, no, Chief, you hit it right on the head. We also do uh, what would be probably best classified as kind of an aptitude test that can give us some some indications on uh, emotional intelligence and, and some of the things you were speaking about as Um and, and then as part of that as part of that background, it is it is very exhaustive. Um, only I can only speak for Dublin Police Department, but we have a very, very thorough background to include everything from social media review to home interviews, neighbor interviews, contact with all previous employers, the military, um, it, it's very extensive, and our detectives do a fantastic job trying to vet the candidates for us. Thanks, Chief. Chief, uh, this is Imran. Just a real quick question. What's the uh, general uh, timelines of this process, like from the time of uh, attempting for the exam to the time a real offer is made and the personnel is hired on? What, what's the general timelines? Yeah, Lieutenant Latanzi can speak to the specifics because he goes through the process of, so when we start a process, what we essentially do is work our way back from the academy date so that we are making sure we give an appropriate amount of time for each of those components to be able to get done. Our backgrounds, I think, take about nine weeks right now. Um, then uh, the process before that where the interview and uh, the interview panel um, for the officers that are uh, sorry for the candidates who have scored highest on the test is a, usually a two week period that we will fit um, to have members of our agency and then a member from human resources be part of that initial uh, screening process and then all the way back up and then we usually set the test date based on our movement backward from uh, an academy date but lieutenant latanzi could probably answer that question on the the amount of time and duration for test to an officer starting the academy. Yeah, I don't want to misquote. I was trying to dive through my email real quick to grab one of the timelines, but I mean, if you could imagine that um, we are um, starting testing this weekend for an academy class that begins in December, I believe. So um, we are looking at several months for that process to, um, to take place and for us to be able to get all the different steps completed. 
Thank you, Lieutenant. Yeah, one of the other pieces I would add, so our our background investigators um, are typically our detectives who also carry a caseload and are responsive to all of those uh, major crimes that they're investigating. So in addition to that caseload they carry, they're also taking on the, the very important work of those background investigations and they fit that all in in that, in that nine week window while also managing everything else that sort of comes at them. But we've kept that in house traditionally because we feel like that gives us a good opportunity to know exactly uh, what we are looking for. And also it's an opportunity for our detectives really to have contact with candidates to share a little bit about what a candidate is coming into joining our agency as well. So having that contact, while there are some agencies, uh, and Ms. Ingram asked a great question, but there are some agencies that do them a little differently. The reason we sort of kept it with us is because there's benefit both for us and for candidates by having that be part of our process. Uh, and then one other thing, uh, just a nuance of how ours is maybe a little different or how we have transitioned and, and considered Considered improving our process based on some of the conversations we have had. We have asked for um, the portion where our psychologicals are conducted. We asked the person who conducts those to make sure that we are including components that screen for uh, potential that there may be bias in a candidate so that we are uh, overtly looking for and having them ask the questions that would give us indications during screening that somebody may have a bias that would not be conducive to them being in a position with our department or serving in this capacity as a police officer. I definitely appreciate all of that, Chief. And one other thing that I thought about um, um, in thinking about how this process unfolds, I, I heard uh, Detective Corporal Kiefer say that there is an online study guide that um, potential applicants can review before taking the exam. And And what triggered in my mind was is that something that uh, has been reviewed and or modified uh, since we've had the, uh, uh, I'll use the word emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Judge, that's a great question. Uh, we don't actually provide or we don't produce that online um, support book or review book. So that is through, and I, I may get the letters wrong here, but I think it's IPMA is the is the test company we purchased the company or we purchased the test from. They actually provide and supply that guidebook as well. And I will tell you, based on some conversation we'd had in the past, um, in, including with yourself, who have helped us think through how do we do a better job of preparing candidates as they come into the test. That was one of the leans forward that we decided to make available to candidates. So while you can go to the test site um, to uh, IPMA to go and purchase one of those um, prep books, we typically buy them. And if people ask for them, we just give them to people. So um, because we want to make sure everybody has every opportunity to know what they're walking into when they take a police test, because uh, it is a unique experience. Uh, it's not a civil service exam uh, per se, but it is different than any other test you're probably going to take in a different environment than you might ever take a test. So uh, we have held uh, sort of um, uh, introductory or prep days uh, here at the Justice Center in the past. Over the last year, we really haven't been able to do that because of, uh, of the COVID protocols, but we're always trying to think through how do we give everybody every opportunity to be successful during the test by, uh, by again, extending ourselves as a, in, in some capacity to assist them in preparing for the exam. All right, thank you. And I hope, Lieutenant, that you will take that back to your advisory committee or some you have some discussion about that that same issue about how do you help persons prepare as 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 much as possible for what they're walking into. I do thanks, Judge. Judge, before we get into the chief's update, I know um, Re uh, Rebecca Myers has joined us now. So if you, I know you had some questions uh, maybe earlier, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity now that uh, Rebecca's come into the meeting to uh, ask those those now. Great, uh, thank you, Chief, and uh, good evening, Rebecca. Glad that you were able to to uh, sign on with us tonight. Um, we were in the old business portion of the agenda. And I know that in the past, I've asked you if there are any old business issues that we need to address. 
and I think we the only one that we covered that that um, I thought I remembered being part of the last meeting was the uh, Dublin Police Department recruitment campaign, and we've had a good discussion about that. But were there any other issues from the last meeting that we needed potentially to address in this portion of the agenda as old business? Yeah, thanks, Judge, and I uh, apologize for the delay. Um, I also resent the um, the links um, from earlier, so everyone should have those um, documents. So I apologize for that technical glitch. Um, for old business, I just wanted to um, address um, our idea for a shared calendar. Um, so I did talk with um, the city's IT department. So everyone um, uh, on this call can be a part of our um, CAC uh, Microsoft Teams account. So we can have our own team, which will facilitate for sharing um, different resources, um, like a lot of the ones that I share via email, we can um, house those there, and then we can have a shared calendar that anyone can see. So if I have everyone's consent, I can make sure that everyone has um, uh, used their emails for this, um, uh, for the committee, and we can flow those into Microsoft Teams and get that created before the next um, meeting in July. So that was, yeah, that's my only update, and I appreciate it, Judge. All right, thank you. And Cameron, I'll talk to you uh, offline so that you can advise me about this new, this new technology Rebecca's talking about. Great. Okay. All right, Chief, you can go ahead with the, uh, your update, thank you. Very good, Judge, and I am going to actually stick uh, with uh, Rebecca because she has uh, a request, if uh, if at all possible. I'll let her go ahead and um, talk about that now. Sure. Um, I can also go back to some of our old meetings, but I thought it would be nice to give everyone a chance just to smile at the camera. I wanted to take a screenshot of everyone and their work um, just so we can remember how we used to meet in this way. And then we'll get a group photo um, in person um, sometime soon. So I just wanted, um, I'm sure I can get a couple other. I'll make sure that everyone else is represented who's not on the call today. Um, just a, a screenshot from a different thing. But if everyone could just look at the camera and, and it'll just take one second and you won't even hear it. <laughs> All right, you're off the hook. Thank you. <laughs> Pictures off the meter, but we heard it, Rebecca, just so you know. <laughs> no, it threw me off my smile too, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just joking. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate it. Um, yes, and, and and as I mentioned last meeting, looking forward to again getting everyone together in person. Um, you know, in the future for our meeting, and love to capture a photo of everyone uh, to commemorate this again inaugural uh, uh, Chiefs Advisory Committee as well. So. Um, so the other uh, highlights I have for the Chiefs update will be brief, but I just wanted to make you aware of a few events that are upcoming uh, in the city of Dublin. So tomorrow evening at 915, um, there are there is going to be what is being advertised as our, our first uh, Pride March in Dublin. So looking very forward to being part of that event tomorrow night. And I wanna thank Ms. Hawk for getting me uh, connected to Mr. Bobby Weston and uh, for the opportunity to be there on behalf of the city and the police department for what I think is going to be a very special occasion tomorrow night and lighting of our bridge in honor of uh, Pride Month this month. So just wanted to make sure everybody was aware and if you are all able to come and join us tomorrow, we'd look forward to seeing you there tomorrow evening as well. Can I add a little bit to that? Yes, please do. So we will have flags for everyone and then also little candles to light along with the bridge and our keynote speaker is going to be Ezra Taylor. He is a graduate of Dublin City Schools, valedictorian. He is out, proud, and transgender. He has spent much of his high school career educating others about queerness and how to accept them in your family and also in your life in general. And he is going to speak to us, and I'm really excited to hear from him. Thank you. Hi. It's at 9.15, and um, we'll be there to watch the bridge lighting. 
Yes, Judge, and I believe the intention is to begin uh, over in front of the library, actually. And then so if you're if you're coming together, either the parking garage at the library or the Darby Street lot would be a, 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 an easy place to park. And then uh, at 915 gather and then the intention was to march over to the, the bridge and then to, to uh, have our first our first, as I said, uh, first pride march across the bridge uh, at the end of the uh, event. So thank you, I uh, appreciate that. And then um, to this weekend, Saturday, June 26, just wanna make sure everyone was aware um, that we will have another one of our drug take back events, which is going to be held at the New Hope Church uh, from 10 until 2, 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. And this event will be in partnership with the Delaware County Sheriff's Office, but another opportunity for the public to be able to come and get rid of uh, unused uh, medication so they're out of the house and into a safe location where they can be um, destroyed. And this is in Powell, correct? This is not in Dublin? Uh, that, yes, that's correct. That's in Powell. Uh, it's uh, no, New Hope Church is actually up near the zoo. Okay, thanks. I know the uh, chief, or I'm sorry, Chair, Chair Maynard and I were having a discussion and we were confused as to whether it was at the police station or somewhere else. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, it's in partnership with Delaware County. And then the other additional benefit is that our chaplain of Steve Norton is actually um, there at the church at New Hope as well. So yeah, it's just a good, good opportunity for us to hold the partnership there and reach a different area of the community than we've had uh, in, in the other events in the past. So thank you for that, uh, for that question. Um, I also, we owed a couple of answers, I think, uh, on records, but before we get to that, um, obviously we have had about a month of our uh, pilot program of the DORA in downtown Dublin, and we wanted to just give this group a little bit of an update on how that has gone and uh, how we have responded in making sure that that is both a safe and enjoyable event here in Dublin, as we do with all special events. So I'd ask Lieutenant Latanzi just to give us a brief update on that activity as well. Good evening again. This should be short and sweet because luckily the door has not produced a whole lot of activity for us, which is a good sign. Uh, things are going well down in the Dora, but again, we're at our five week point right now on the pilot of the door. It started on May 20th. May 20th. That will continue through August for um, for council then to evaluate that and see where that uh, goes uh, from that point. However, we've provided some additional staffing uh, both in historic Dublin and in Bridge Park uh, for, for those hours of the DORA. And <clears throat> luckily we have not had any significant issues from uh, a policing perspective during the DORA hours uh, and, and no calls for service honestly can be directly attributed to uh, the pilot of the DORA. There are about 30 calls for service that those officers working um, that detail have responded to, but those were calls for service that we would have gotten just in the course of their regular duties. Uh, anyway, however, having them down there in, in those uh, door areas provided us an opportunity to quickly respond and resolve those, those issues that we would have dealt with anyway. So uh, things are going well with the DORA. We hope that it continues and uh, we're looking forward to council's perspective on that in August. Um, how many officers are there usually um, when DORA is happening? Well, besides what our normal uh, second shift uh, team looks like that's that's regularly patrolling the street, we added five officers to that detail. So we split those officers up, uh, two officers uh, in the historic Dublin area, two in the Bridge Park area, and then one was uh, in a cruiser handling any potential traffic related or pedestrian related concerns that uh, that might have arose uh, during those times. And that's an excellent question. I mean, it, it, it's a new event for us. So, you know, what Latan Latanzi described was us extending or adding additional resources in the area so that we can make sure everyone feels safe. So there were several public meetings that occurred leading up to council's decision to approve a pilot program for the DORA and hearing those concerns about alcohol violations, pedestrian traffic and, and vehicle traffic in the uh, Bridge Park area sort of coinciding with those activities, also noise concerns in the area as it related to the DORA. We wanted to make sure we had officers there so that, again, everyone felt comfortable. And then also knowing this was one of the first events coming out of COVID where we were really, as a city, promoting 
activity and everybody coming back together. We just want to make sure that whatever might inhibit somebody from coming or being part and taking part in our uh, our um, pilot program, we were doing everything we can in addition to uh, our, our normal patrol duties, also making sure we had resources. So all of those officers that Lieutenant Latandi uh, just described as part of that sort of deployment in the area, we're all on overtime or additional staffing we were paying. As we come into the midpoint check-in of the pilot program, which will occur uh, on Monday during the council meeting, Lieutenant Latanzi worked on a memo along with event staff that's going to council on how things are going so far. We will, after that, uh, after that point, then reassess how many do we need in that area and how do we balance uh, covering that with some of the other demands that we have and focuses in the city. But again, on an initial event, we would always lean forward and just make sure we have more than is necessary um, and more than we hope will ever be necessary, just to make sure everybody is both safe, but also feel safe in coming to those events. Well, thank you, Lieutenant, I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions on Adora? All right, very good. Um, so, uh, uh, Director Somerville uh, was out of the office during our last meeting, but I know we had some questions uh, on the records commission, which I, I briefly found some information to answer on, but wanted to make sure somebody who has more direct involvement and certainly uh, more experience with our records commission uh, could share some information with the group on how that works and how that changes and, and what the um, amendments we make to that uh, records uh, uh, retention uh, plan each year. So good evening, everyone. What a timely uh, coincidence that we have. The Records Commission met this morning and considered seven recommendations that the police department brought to them to make some changes to our records retention schedule. Our Records Commission is a code required commission uh, that interfaces with um, the history connection with the state of Ohio. And they're charged with the retention and destruction of public records. And in Ohio, public records law requires governmental entities to maintain documentation uh, anytime there is conducting of the people's business. And you start from a default point of you must maintain records forever unless your local records commission allows for destruction uh, within reasonable time frames. So it's a two step process. The records commission develops a records retention schedule, which I believe we've shared with you. Um, after having hearings in a public meeting format to determine uh, three things, which records uh, are specifically identified, how long are they to be retained at a minimum, and in what form do those records need to be maintained? Here in Dublin, we meet the criteria for our records commission. We have a member of our finance department. Uh, that's Jerry O'Brien, uh, one of our chief auditors. We have a member of our law department. That's Steve Smith Jr. from the city's law firm. We have a member at large, and I feel terrible because I cannot remember Ms. Gowdy's name, first name, but uh, it's a member or citizen at large uh, appointed by council. And then it is chaired by our court services director, Lisa Schoening, who oversees our records collection, storage, retention, and destruction. So we have a long time, well-established records retention schedule. Section 100 applies specifically to the police department. We uh, attempt to go through that records retention schedule at least two times a year, right before the records commission meets. And uh, it is the responsibility of each department and division in the city to make recommendations to the records commission for um, new records that may start. Uh, we had two new records that, that we added to the retention schedule. And also to keep the records retention schedule up to date for records that no longer exist. So one of the unique aspects of the records commission is they don't mandate any records be kept. They don't mandate in what form they're kept. They just are the guardians of the documents of the people's business. So uh, just real quick, and I'll make sure this goes out with your next packet uh, because it is truly hot off the press. The Records Commission considered seven items. 
uh, five of which were revisions and two of which were new records requests. Um, the revisions, fairly simple. Uh, we changed the record that we use to track crime reports in the city. Um, a couple of years ago, we started a transition from reporting our crime statistics to the FBI using a format called Uniform Crime Reports, which was a summary report of our crime stats. And we made the full transition to incident-based reporting, where we report every incident, every incident report that we take is now statistically reported to the FBI on a monthly basis. So we made a change in name uh, for that record so that we're accurately reflecting the record that we actually keep. Uh, my favorite recommendation of the Records Commission was we asked them to remove the arrest logbook. As you can imagine, this day and age, it's hard to believe we had a physical arrest logbook like you think you would see on Andy Griffith in the 50s. Um, we used that book in order to keep track of arrest ID packets. When we would arrest someone, we would take all of the information, uh, place it in an arrest packet that would stay with that person um, for all the contacts that they had with Dublin police. And we had to number those packets, and the way we did it was we used the old arrest logbook. Well, uh, we have finally transitioned away from that old uh, record-keeping process. We no longer have the arrest logbook, although we intend to hold on to it for historical purposes, for nothing more than to, to, to show how we used to do things. Uh, so in a series of three requests, uh, we asked them to uh, discontinue tracking of arrest logbooks and then change the media in which we keep arrest ID packets from physical hard copy to electronic. So we have an electronic records management system, and when you are uh, arrested, receive a citation, uh, it's documented in that system. We now take all of the associated paperwork, mostly the fingerprint card, any uh, booking information that we have, scan it into the system so it's locked on your record. It also gives us the ability to go back and look and determine anyone who has taken a look at that record. Um, what we used to do in the past is lock all of those records up in a filing cabinet of rather large size and then keep a physical log of who requested access to those packets. Um, we can now do that through uh, modern day electronic tracking technology, so that makes it a lot easier. One of the more significant changes that we asked for was a change in the title and retention period of our, I'll call them event recordings. We used to refer to them as cruiser camera recordings, but of course we introduced body-worn cameras. So we had a discussion with the Records Commission on how they believed it would be best that we carry these records. And the Records Commission recommended and adopted a single records retention schedule item entitled cruiser and body-worn camera recordings. So they have now lumped all of the recordings together in one retention, and we asked them to extend the minimum retention time for all of those recordings from 45 days, which was the original retention period, out to a minimum of six months. So that is for any recording that is taken that has no evidentiary value, is not part of any incident report, investigation, uh, response to resistance, uh, any court proceeding that's coming up. Anytime they're marked for those things, they are kept in accordance with a different schedule, which is for the life of the case and a minimum amount of time. What we asked them to do was boost those minimum storage requirements for cruiser camera and body-worn camera videos that, that don't have any of that value, but we wanna make sure we hold on to for a minimum of six months so that if anyone wants to request those videos to see the documentation of the public's business, or maybe they have another uh, interest with that recording, we'll occasionally um, go on a non-criminal incident and that, that video may be of value to someone and they can make a public records request. Where before we were only holding it for 45 days, we're now gonna be holding it for six months. 
We did ask for two new classifications of records. The first was after action reports. Every time we handle a critical incident, um, every time we put together a special event plan, uh, we're always looking to review our performance and write a report and do an analysis on how well we did and how we can do better for the next event or the next critical incident. So we asked them to create a new specific category of records called after action reports that we be allowed to retain them in both paper and digital format and that we keep those records for a minimum of five years. So if we need to do a look back of how we did things at the Irish Festival for the previous five years, or the public wants to go back and look at those after action reports, they can get up to five years minimum of those reports. And again, I think it's, it's good to point out that five years is a minimum retention. We may keep them longer, and any time we keep a public record longer than its retention period, it is always available to the public. So if it's got a five-year retention, but we have a seven-year-old report, we cannot say to the requester, oh, it's after five years, you're not entitled to it. That doesn't happen here. If we hold the record in accordance with Ohio law, we produce it. So again, that's just a minimum retention time. One of the items that we saw in the last one that we uh, asked the commission to address is when we collectively put together a new retention period for cruiser videos and body worn camera videos, we asked to break out interview and interrogation room recordings. So anytime we bring someone into our facility to do an interview related to a crime or a case, and we conduct that interview in an interview room, or an interrogation room, we record those separately. And we often record them in multiple ways, but each of the uh, four rooms that we have are audio and video recorded. We may also record that on body cam, but if we're bringing someone in for questioning, we do a specific interview and interrogation room recording. We ask them to break that out on the schedule in digital format. And we ask them to put an indefinite retention period on it that is specifically tied to the statute of limitations that interview is related to in that case. Or until such time as there is another disposition as issued by a court that allows us to go ahead and dispose of that video. So we intend on holding that video a very extended period of time and tying it to the case disposition and the court's allowance for us to go ahead and destroy that video. And the records commission agreed with all of our recommendations and voted to implement them effective immediately. So I'll make sure you get a copy of the changes that we recommended as well as a copy of the new records retention schedule as soon as it comes out. And with that, that's all I have on records retention. Be glad to answer any questions you have. I don't have any specific questions, but I remember a lot of those types of documents that you were referring to, Jay. So um, fun to walk down memory lane in that regard. And Cam, you probably should stay in touch with uh, Jay about this type of issue because uh, you'll be ahead of a lot of your first year law uh, colleagues um, if you have some of this information in your back pocket. I mean, Jay and I are connected on LinkedIn. I'm already a step ahead of you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Director. I appreciate the update. And uh, Judge, the last piece I have from the Chief's update, I owed you a response and answer as it related to public records. Uh, you, uh, We had asked a question during the meeting last week about the number of public records requests we have had for our body-worn camera video. Uh, so I, I checked with our records manager, and I apologize, I didn't get the answer back out to the group. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we, um, we answered it tonight as part of the meeting. So in 2019, when we started the body camera program, we had had only one uh, public record 
for any video that entire year. Uh, in 2020, as we rolled the program out to all officers, uh, we had a total of 10 requests for incidents for body uh, body worn camera video. And so far this year, up until uh, the month of June, we have had six requests total. So we don't have an abundance. Um, as we talked last time, producing those uh, records sometimes takes a little bit of time for our records manager and for the record staff. Um, but uh, they're different in producing them for court or for other agencies than they are for the public. Uh, but 17 total is what we sit at currently as far as public requests for body camera video. And I just wanted to make sure I return that information and answer to the group. And that is uh, that is everything I have for the chief's update tonight. Great, thank you, chief. Anybody have any uh, other questions for the chief before we move out of uh, this portion of the agenda? All right. Very good. We'll move into new business, the new business portion of the uh, meeting. I'm going to say that we're going to skip the current events for the time being, whether we have any to discuss or not. We'll come back to that. Let's try and get through the other uh, agenda items. So, are there any other outstanding questions about body worn, the body worn camera program? And the corporal that did that's not with us tonight anyway. So, right. Uh, Corporal Dalbert is not with us tonight, but we would certainly, um, you know, be willing to answer any questions anyone might have, or take if we cannot tonight, take those back to Corporal Dalgord and make sure we brought answers back or Corporal Dalgord back to a future meeting. Uh, and certainly, that is always a, a uh, option on the table for any of the topics we have covered previously for those members to come back and share some information uh, if we have something that comes up at future meetings. All right, I don't. If you do have a question, just speak up now, whoever it is, and and go ahead and ask your question. If not, I definitely want to talk about these aspirational goals update. So I don't know who's going to lead that discussion, but um, and I think Rebecca, you said you sent something about that tonight, correct? Yes, hopefully that was the one that you could open um, and but I resent it just in case. Um, uh, so uh, the chief, I think, has um, kind of some notes that we discussed earlier today um, about um, how the DEI plan for the city is going. Okay, so Rebecca, were you part of whatever the task force meeting was, or was that chief just you and Esau again? Judge, yes, I, I attended the meeting and Esau was there at the meeting, uh, but Rebecca was not was not present uh, during that meeting. Okay. All right. So has everybody on the committee had the opportunity to review the aspirational goals draft, if not the one that Rebecca sent out this evening, the one that she asked us all to um, provide additional feedback on by I think it was the 20th of June, right, Rebecca? Yes. Okay. Um, and it, there wasn't very many changes. Um, the the chief might know a couple um, things from the task force, but um, it, we just kind of maybe tweaked a few um, style style phrases, but that's about it. Yeah, Judge, I can jump in here if you if you'd like. If we don't have any questions, and sort of walk through where we ended last meeting, uh, the work we did in between meetings, and then where the uh, task force sits currently with their comprehensive plan, they are uh, planning on presenting to City Council in August. I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure if anyone has any any uh, community partner has any questions or concerns be 
before you give your report that they get a chance to ask the questions. So anyone, or do you want the chief to just go ahead? You shake your head or whatever the chief will know because I can't see you all. Yeah, just that's the same, Ron. I, I had a chance to review so far, so I think uh, you know, if no one has any objections, I think the chief should proceed. Uh, and I think uh, I'm sure once we submit it, we're probably going to get some some feedback as well that we can probably take into a future discussion, hopefully an in-person one. So. Well, one thing, uh, Chief, go ahead and give give the update that you want to give. And I'm I'm curious to to hear what the feedback was that you got from the task force. Yes, sir. So the last time we were together, we obviously talked through the aspirational goals, and part of that discussion was us preparing an offering to the uh, community task force under the umbrella of public safety. And so thank you all for your contributions during our last meeting. What we did in the aftermath of that meeting was we tried to collect uh, that information and then incorporate it into the document we presented at the last meeting. So I want to thank the lieutenants and uh, Rebecca for working collectively. Actually, they got together the week of the memorial memorial tournament uh, up at the up at the grounds there to work through the document as they were uh, managing security and communications for the event as well. So I want to thank them for their efforts in consolidating some of our um, recommendations we talked about last time and then uh, clarifying some of the language and incorporating some of those recommendations and feedback uh, into the document. We then sent that back out uh, to the group and then just asked for any additional input that anyone might have. And, and we're, um, again, very appreciative of, of the feedback we got. Uh, and then we forwarded that information to the city manager's office to incorporate and include in the report that they presented to the community task force. I think it was two weeks ago now was the community task force meeting. Uh, so I got a chance to be part of that meeting and discussion uh, at the uh, community task force level. I typically do attend those meetings uh, and Esau uh, was uh, there as part of that discussion as well. And so we just walked through the document to give everyone on the task force an opportunity to share any sort of feedback or takeaways as uh, their initial and impressions of the uh, draft of the task force uh, comprehensive report. And so under the discussion of the public safety aspirational goals, we really had just four takeaways that, uh, that I wrote down that were discussions about uh, the bullets as we had suggested for recommendations. Uh, the first was from the chair of the community task force um, uh, who asked, that there were, didn't seem to be a bullet that uh, Mr. Amposa uh, offered, there didn't seem to be a bullet that overtly talked about communication as a two-way communication between the police department and the community, that it was overtly stated within the document that it, it, it is our aspirational goal for there to be an open and two-way ongoing communication between the police department uh, and the community. And while I think that it is in fact implied in some of those bullets, I, I always think it's better to just go ahead and call it out and list it uh, if it is something that you want to uh, be a focus of an aspirational goal or document. So we're going to incorporate that feedback um, into the document itself. Um, the second uh, point uh, was uh, from the uh, uh, the vice chair of the um, community task force, and it related to one of our bullet points uh, as it re uh, discussed procedural justice with young people. And the only question uh, really from uh, the perspective of the vice chair was, uh, why is it just specifically young people that are called out in procedural justice? Shouldn't it be procedural justice with all members of the community. And so we talked through how we had developed the recommendations and bullet points and that being a component that was listed and highlighted in that Yale collaboratory study of procedurally just policing, focusing again on vulnerable communities and calling out that young people are in fact a population we want to make sure we in an aspirational goal call out that thinking of how we interact from a police community interaction standpoint with young people to include and make sure that those practices are procedurally just. So what we, I think, are going to reconcile with that bullet point is to have it reflect procedurally just practices for all members of the community with a focus on 
uh, or an emphasis on uh, contacts with uh, young people. So I think that that marries both the idea of procedurally just practices for everyone, but also with a specific focus on interactions with young people in the community. Uh, and then the other two um, uh, recommendations or, or questions rather from the vice chair re uh, related to one question about a aspirational goal or discussion about domestic violence response and procedure. Uh, and so the way we this, uh, talk through including that recommendation in our um, aspirational goals was to fit that discussion of policy among the policies that we call out in our aspirational goals as important for the police department to have a regular discussion on or a periodic discussion on because it is a policy that has a significant impact uh, as it relates to police contact in the community. Uh, and so the other policies that we have listed in our um, aspirational goals under ensuring transparency and accountability, the city, the city solicits community input when making or revising policies on topics included, but not limited to response to resistance, officer involved critical incidents, body worn cameras, pursuit, school resource officer program and community liaison program. We felt like including policies and procedure as they relate to domestic violence response uh, would be a place for us to be able to list that specific policy within the aspirational goals and meet what the vice chair was asking to have some consideration of that policy as part of our ongoing uh, re uh, revision and and considerations and conversations uh, at, at public uh, as a public public safety conversation. Uh, and the other recommendation, which I don't think will end up making it into the finalized draft was a question or uh, about an inclusion of a bullet point on bail reform, which uh, for the city of Dublin, we don't operate a, a jail here in Dublin. We do take bond at the uh, at the mayor's court, but as it relates to comprehensive bail reform, it's not something that we would necessarily have impact or the ability to shape within the framework of the city of Dublin by itself. Um, so that was just another just sort of commentary or question. And those were really the four points uh, in total that uh, there were any sort of feedback or, or commentary on the public safety aspirational goals during the community task force. Uh, Ch Chief and, and uh... Rebecca, I was I was surprised somewhat that you had that you had uh, reduced the number of bullet points um, that you submitted to the task force um, in light of the discussions that we had had before, and I, and with respect to that. Um, that bullet point about in promoting public safety and sense of security, the, the point about the uh, police department employing procedural justice in interaction with young people. When I look back at the draft that we had for aspirational goals from the May meeting, there were two bullets that were together. The first one says, engage with young people in the community regarding public safety and then it was followed by the bullet to employ procedural justice in interactions with young people and in light of the the, the question i guess that was asked by the vice chair i'm wondering if you just combine those two bullets or put them back to back the way that they were originally if that would address the concern that she raised, because you you're talk you're talking about that constituency group specifically, saying that the department wants to engage with them regarding public safety, so have them be aware of the role of law enforcement in the community, and then when it comes to the, that interaction that's beyond just informing them, you talk about procedural justice in, in interactions with young people. I'm, I'm wondering if, the, if that wouldn't help 
alleviate whatever concern that the, the vice chair had. Hey, Judge, I think that's a good point uh, because it may have informed the walk in to that secondary or that second bullet as um, as the vice chair read it. I, I would offer that part of that discussion, what I took from that presentation was just it, it was more that even that first bullet talking about uh, awareness and interaction with uh, young people. Um, from the impression I took away from that discussion, that would have also been one that they would have um, discussed, at least considered expanding to all members of the community as well. It may have actually, to your point, I think it might have actually invited that um, response on both of the bullets, which again could have informed uh, and can still, because we are still in the process of building that comprehensive um, report, we can add that back in there and expand it just as we did with the um, Dublin Police Employee procedural, procedural Justice Interactions with um, all members of the community with a focus on, on young people. We can add that additional bullet from the original draft back in and then work that language uh, to be reflective of, uh, of that other bullet as well. And, and I um, also just, and then I'm done, everybody else, you can jump in. But under uh, ensuring transparency and accountability, the initial uh, draft that you look, we looked at on May 25th had as its first bullet point, hold public monthly meetings of the Chief's Advisory Committee. And I don't know why you would have given that up as an important, uh, effort of um, community engagement because in engagement and public trust, you said establish an ongoing chief's advisory committee. And then when you get to ensuring transparency and accountability, you don't, the document doesn't follow that up by saying that one of the things that we're going to do or recommend doing is having these monthly meetings of a, of a chief's advisory committee that sort of gives the public the buy-in that there's going to be this ongoing dialogue between the department and the community. I, I, no, I think that's a great uh, point as well, Judge. And again, and this is why I love the, the uh, coming back and revisiting sort of the recommendations and then edits because it helps us then hear um, the input and feedback on something that we thought might be implied, but is important to call out. Just as I said earlier, um, uh, from the chairs, uh, the community task force chairs perspective on calling out that two way dialogue. And we want to do better than just imply it. We want to make sure we overtly say it. And so I think to your point that we list it under uh, cultivating community engagement and public trust that we are establishing the committee, that we are committing to there being an ongoing dialogue, a monthly meeting, um, I, I think is important as well to make sure that we we overtly list in there. I completely uh, hear where you're coming from and we can add that back into that uh, that second list under ensuring transparency and accountability as well, because it is an important part just as we're having this meeting today. I'm off the soapbox. Anybody else? For now, thank you. Imran, anything? Good judge. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Pam. Cameron, anything? Sorry, Judge, I stepped away to use the restroom. Nothing from me. Thank you. Uh, Susan? Nope, I'm, and I apologize. I'm just working on some internet stuff so my camera's off for a minute, but nope, I think all those discussion points made sense. Okay, Courtney? Uh, nothing in particular. I thought you brought up some good points, so I was happy to hear that and just, um, I think in general, I look, you know, I kind of did my own looking back and forth and looking at the draft and looking at what was sent out. And I thought, I thought it looked cleaned up to be honest, um, but I did, I, I do appreciate the points you brought up. So, yeah. Okay. And my final question chief is that they didn't give you any uh, questioning or feedback or 
yeah, questioning on this bullet point that says Dublin police fosters guardian police culture and partnership with the community that assesses and rewards activities that increase public trust and confidence. Nobody asked you what that where that came from. You know, Judge, I, I, I had so many meetings and discussions about this list. I'm trying to remember if that came up. I know it came up, but I think it was during our discussion, frankly. Um, and uh, so and the other thing I would offer is that this is a very big document right now. I think it's and, and Rebecca may remind, uh, may correct me if I'm missing, but because she, she talked to um, uh, Mr. Durth over in the city manager's office, who has been charged with putting everything together. But I think it's like 26 pages um, when it's all said and done. And so I. I they sent it out to the task force early in the week, um, but with just enough time that you probably had time if you um, if you really got on it to read through and comprehensively look at everything. But as we all know, sometimes when we get that sort of volume of information, you end up sort of skimming through. And I don't know that anybody who was outside of this group was paying attention with the same level of intensity. And, and it's no fault to, the, to them at all. They, they have a lot to... Um, wrap around with the entire community plan. I just don't think that anybody picked up on that one and, and decided during the meeting to ask the question. So um, so I, I think it will come up. And, and what I do like about it coming up and, and being asked is we get a chance to articulate out loud what that means. And so sometimes a two-dimensional document sits sort of in the background and, and it's great and it's important. And my hope is that somebody from council when it gets presented asks, what does this mean by guardian? Now I've had that conversation, but to do so in public, so we get a chance to continue to articulate the difference in philosophy that that connotates by choosing that language specifically. Yeah, I'm I'm sure it was in our discussion, and, I, and I'm almost positive it was Ajmeri that asked you about it. <laughs> so, okay, okay, thanks for that. Um, I, I guess. Um, just the follow up before we would move away from this chief is did they ask you at all about um, the terminology I think that's correct is indicators of success for any of these and is that something that we need to discuss that is a conversation that did come up um, with uh, Mr. Durth over in the city manager's office um, and, and uh, Rebecca just had a meeting with him today. So I'll ask her to correct me again if, if there's any additional um, change in that. But ultimately what they saw were the bullet points that are underneath those headings as sort of our indicators uh, from our perspective. So the level of specificity that we talked about in our last meeting about metrics was really something they expected to come in further iterations of the conversations that are happening at council at a uh, task force or community advisory committee, which may be coming as one of the recommendations from the task force or as a chief's advisory committee to dig into those sort of X's and O's, those metrics um, that are tracking what success looks like over time. Uh, one of the things that I, I did get a chance to learn from the conversations after the task force meeting was that Oregon, um, that Beaverton, Oregon diversity, equity and inclusion plan that we have seen and that the task force was provided from the city manager, sort of a template that they adopted as the guide for our community plan is really a second iteration or the second report. Um, the first report really was very broad, aspirational, sort of what we've been tasked with. Um, providing for the public safety realm, but also from the community task force perspective, charged with putting together to give to council in August. The secondary report was a report where it broke down then those metrics. Um, so that was sort of the progress of that discussion in Beaverton, Oregon as well, which is the hope and intention of the, uh, the comprehensive plan that the task force is providing to council. So we'll get a chance to talk about those, those metrics as part of our discussions and to have that help inform uh, community progress as a whole as it relates to public safety in the future as well. Okay, and um, what is the date of the uh, council meeting in August where we are supposed to present whatever else we're supposed to present? I believe it's August 16th. August 16th. Okay. And Chief, are we going to be working on an, another document in addition to the one that we have now uh, offered, presented to 
the task force for their consideration? Judge, I think that's an excellent recommendation. That would be sort of our one year point to check in from the advisory committee perspective as well. So um, that is something that uh, Rebecca and I can get with um, when uh, you and Ajmeri to talk about what that document looks like and, and what that reflection looks like as a year check in point for both the community task force and for the advisory committee. I think that that's an excellent recommendation uh, 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 for us to take forward and start working on tonight. I don't know that I was trying to give Ashmeri and me more work, <laughs> no, but, but uh, that'll be fine uh, from my my perspective. Ashmeri, are you okay with that as well? Yes, of course. Okay. And judge, I didn't mean to imply we were putting it in your lap. We will we can work on it on our end and then prepare something for you guys to uh, review and give input and feedback on or just to have discussion and we will work on making sure we draft it uh, on our end uh, to again make it um, as inclusive, but also as simple uh, as we can for you because we know your time's very valuable and we certainly appreciate you spending your time with us when you can. I enjoy collaborative efforts, so. It's it's okay to include me at least. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't have anything else. Anybody? Anybody else? If not, um, we can move into Lieutenant Tabernack's um, presentation on officer-involved critical incidents. We might make 730 people. Thanks, Judge. Just making sure you guys can still hear me. Good. Awesome. So uh, when we talk about officer involved critical incident, um, you, you know, it, it's something that make no mistake about it will be the most impactful event that our agency has been a part of and probably the most impactful, impactful event or one of the most impactful events that the city um, will have involvement in. And it has the potential, as you know, to bring national, um, perhaps international attention to the city. And it's one of those um, low frequency, very, very high impact events. So I just kind of put that as the background. Um, you, all, you all know that we've obviously uh, seen some of this in the news, but I wanted to provide that as, as kind of the foundation moving forward here. We also fully realize um, that competent and accountable response to resistance investigations, uh, like we talked about a couple months ago, that they're critical for maintaining the public's confidence in their police department, our police department, um, and why we know that a policy like this has to be right. And I will offer, and we'll offer at the end of this, um, we, we are seeking your feedback uh, and your thoughts about this policy specifically. And Ms. Myers will provide this policy in its entirety to you after this, um, but we wanted to at least give an introduction into it and go through some of the pieces of it um, at a high level before you're able to comb through the six page policy document. Um, and I wanna throw out a couple quick definitions right from the policy, just to make sure we're all on the same page. When we're talking about an officer involved critical incident, we're talking about an incident where a law enforcement officer, uh, one of our officers has fired a weapon at a subject or where the law enforcement officer's actions result in another person's serious injury or death. Included under this overall definition would be an in custody death. Um, and again, just to make sure we're in the same uh, vernacular here, um, an officer involved uh, a in custody death, excuse me, um, it is the death of any person who is detained under arrest or is in the process of being arrested, is in route to be incarcerated or held in the Dublin Justice Center temporary holding facility. Uh, that's a lot of stuff there, but I wanted to at least have some definitions out there when we're, when I'm speaking about officer involved critical incident and we have some dialogue about officer involved critical incidents. Those are the types of things that we're talking about. So um, policy intent, we'll always wanna start with, with intent up front and, and put that right out there. Um, our intention right now, if we were to have an officer involved critical incident, 
would be to call Ohio BCI, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation and Identification, to provide us with an independent um, and complete outside investigation into that officer-involved critical incident. I will note that has always been um, that has always been our policy to have an outside entity investigate an officer-involved critical incident. Um, and right now, again, obviously, as, as you've seen in the news, um, Ohio BCI is the resident experts within the law enforcement community in investigating these. So all the more reason for us um, to request them should this ever happen. Uh, the policy as a whole, and again, you'll see this, you'll see this uh, once Ms. Meyer sends it to you, it, we want to provide direction to our officers. Uh, we want to provide direction to our supervisors. And we want to make sure that they understand how important um, something like this will be and then understand their roles as officers and supervisors when this, uh, if this were to happen. So as part of that, I would say four of the six pages are operational considerations. And we can get into those um, if there are any questions or you know, we can get into those once you guys have a chance to look at the policy. But what I'm talking about with operational considerations are everything from when the officer-involved critical incident happens all the way through us uh, stabilizing the scene, BCI coming out to conduct the investigation, and then us leaving the scene. So when you think about securing an area after an officer-involved shooting, protecting evidence so that when BCI comes out, they can collect that evidence and evaluate it, interviewing all witnesses available, um, providing additional public safety. So just because, and I'll try to keep this general, um, just because we have a scene in a certain area, especially with a discharge of a firearm, that doesn't mean that that bullet has, has been contained to that area. So we have an obligation as a public safety agency to make sure that there's no other impact to our public, no other impact to the community members. So that could be canvassing the area, knocking on doors, making sure no one else was impacted, no one else needs medical aid. Um, no one else needs us for anything Anything else. So those, those are a lot of the operational considerations. Again, we want to make sure to have those so that our officers and our supervisors have direction in, once again, a, a, a very high-speed incident. Um, among these, we wanted to make sure we, we threw this right out there. I, I know we talked about duty to render aid during the uh, response to resistance, resistance portion of this. So our duty to render aid, we also felt it important to reiterate within this officer-involved critical incident. And that is our, our officers will provide uh, first aid, basic, basic first aid in accordance with their training until medical, uh, medical personnel can get there. They will call medical personnel as soon as practical. Um, and until those medics are able to get there, we will provide aid in accordance with, with our training. So I wanna stop there. That's kind of our, that's kind of the broad hey, this is what the policy looks like. I, I have a little more background for you, but I wanted to make sure to give an opportunity for any questions, if anyone has any right now. Okay, great. Next slide, please. Wait, I had a question. I was just waiting. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. You talked about the discharge of a weapon as the scenario, but you could also have uh, a Dublin uh, officer involved critical incident like with a highway chase or something like that where there's a, a, a crash or a crash that leads to death or something like that as well it doesn't have to it's not just or is it just the um the uh, discharging of a weapon scenario judge that is a great question um and, and it's not to answer your question um, in a very short way, but I'll expand upon that. Um, it's not just discharging a firearm. It's, it's any time that um, a suspect perishes in our, in our custody um, or, or on a scene, but to include if we were to have, God forbid, a, a fatal accident involving an officer, um, we would use an outside agency to investigate that as well. Um, if we were to have for example, and some of the policy covers this, and you don't have it in front of you, so I will, I will cover it uh, for you here. If we were to have, for example, 
um, one of our officers that's involved uh, outside of our jurisdiction for some reason on a mutual aid call, uh, we would we would defer to the agency of jurisdiction to conduct that investigation. And I can tell you, I can't speak for every agency um, in our region, but I can tell you the vast, vast majority, if not all, would use BCI just as we would. So we would get that same independent investigation from the same agency that we would use, even if we were outside of the jurisdiction, just like you said, if something took us outside of the jurisdiction. Does that answer your question? Anything else on that front portion? Okay, so to kind of give it just a really short um, recent history lesson, uh, in 2012, we, Chief Pice, uh, Lieutenant Watanzi, and I participated in a scenario-based exercise. It was a live exercise um, out in, in the city, and it was a chance for us to figure out in, in, um, in the case of an officer-involved critical incident, what does that look like? What does it look like when we call BCI? What is the FOP's responsibility? Um, what's BCI's expectations of us? And so that was, that was really the first time that we took a bite out of the apple of drafting policy and running through an exercise with our personnel. Um, and then fast forward, it, it had been about seven years or so and as you know, and we've talked about, we always like to make sure that we're looking at our policies, procedures, practices to make sure that we're up to date, best practices um, moving forward. So the kind of research and review for this iteration of the policy began in 2019 um, when, when Lieutenant Lathanzi and I actually linked up with some of our law enforcement um, command staff counterparts at other agencies to think through this a little bit more and once again, make sure that we are giving our officers and supervisors the correct direction um, should this happen. So as part of that, uh, we, we came up with an internal committee, and I will tell you this was a excellent work group uh, from inside the police department and a representative work group, cross section, a very nice cross section of our entire department to include NREC upstairs, to include our investigation section, our patrol section, our tactics unit, um, drone operators. We had we had a lot of uh, a lot of input from some some of our fantastic members, and that was important because I'll speak for myself here. I don't know everything or hardly anything, so we have great members who can inform me, who can inform us from an operational level. What does this look like? What information do you need? What direction do you need? What guidance do you need? So being able to rely on their training, their experience, um, and getting their overall input was highly beneficial to drafting this new policy. Um, and then we also did a tabletop exercise, which I will get to in a minute. As part of this work group, it was about four months long um, and very valuable because we were able to bring BCI in. So the thought was, we have an understanding, we're gonna call BCI out. We have a general understanding of what they're going to do and be responsible for, but we really wanted to see, okay, what do they expect from us to in preserving evidence? What do they expect when they show up on scene? How can we assist them in their investigation uh, to make sure that it's done properly? So we were fortunate to have several representatives from BCI, including one of their supervisors um, from their critical incident response team come in and give us a lengthy training session of sorts, um, which I found to be highly beneficial and informative. So that was a really cool part of, of this committee. And then uh, lastly, we, we also had FOP Lodge 9 President Keith Farrell come in to discuss their role and our role um, when we're looking at the legal aspects of that investigation for our involved member, and then also or officer support in, in those situations? How do we support the officer who has just who has just had to do something that no one wants to do um, and, and something that's going to change his or her, her life and then also the lives of everyone impacted and their families? 
Um, it's a very significant event. We fully realized that. So we had we had FOP Lodge 9 uh, president in to kind of talk through that as well, what that could look like, um, what we could assist with, you know, with our officer and how we could help and support them in coordination with BCI because it's going to be a giant coordinated effort. So I know that is a lot of information, but I will stop and take a pause here again to provide an opportunity for any questions or comments. I have a question. So yeah. how do you, if, if you do have to, how do you reconcile what Dublin Police Department's policies and procedures are then with what and the FOP's policies uh, overall um, policies of other departments, um, it looks like there are there are several organizations who influence Dublin Police Department here. And who do we give precedent to? That's, that's a great question. Okay, so when we break this out a little further, um, we, when you think of BCI, they are conducting what is now a criminal investigation. And I'm sure Ms. Hawk and, and Judge Maynard, you're very familiar with the, you know, this piece of it. They're conducting the criminal investigation with the officer or officers as potential suspects in, in what is a um, is what in what is a homicide. So they have the criminal investigation. They have the accountability and the ownership of that criminal investigation. We do not. We want that independent investigation. The Fraternal Order of Police has an obligation to their member, who would be one of our involved or several of our involved officers, to make sure that they are provided with the appropriate legal protections and then office and, and also the support um, from other agency members to get that member through what everything that they're going to go through in the aftermath of a shooting. So that's why I say it is it is really a coordinated effort, but BCI has the accountability and responsibility for that criminal investigation. And so when we when we talk about, you know, there's very intentional language in here. When we're talking about preserving evidence, we literally mean preserve evidence. We as a Dublin Police Department are not collecting evidence. That is BCI's responsibility as part of the criminal investigation. I'm hoping I'm answering what you're looking for there. No, you are, you are you're breaking it down even further, which is, which is what I was looking for. Um, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So, uh, we go into this a little bit further. Actually, this is an extension of what you, uh, just talked about. So thank you for the segue. Um, every involved officer in one of these officer involved critical incidents will be placed on administrative duty or administrative leave. Um, and as part of that, it, it's, it's going to be vitally important. So I will actually jump to the third bullet here. Um, we will do everything that we can to provide professional mental health assistance, um, EAP assistance, chaplains, chaplain assistance, peer support assistance. I'll get to that in a second. Um, for that member, again, as they're going through this criminal investigation, uh, we we have an obligation and a duty to help our members out um, to make sure that they remain well as this investigation continues to unfold. So when I talked about the criminal investigation from a BCI standpoint, once the criminal investigation is complete, we will launch a administrative investigation. There's a few legal reasons why, uh, as Miriam and, and Judge again hate to single you out, I'm sure you un you understand the legal reasons behind that. But essentially, we want to make sure that that independent criminal investigation is done, completely done, before we move on to the administrative investigations where we evaluate was what the officer did in line with our policies and procedures. So the first criminal part is was what the officer did in line with the law, and then we move into was it in line with our policies and procedures at an administrative level. Does that make sense? It's on the explanation, and, and if anybody has a question, I think the lieutenant would be able to answer it. He's doing a good job. 
I had a um, question. Um, how are we how, how are we evaluating what type of mental health and um, assistance they need? I don't believe everybody reacts the same way, right? So do we just have one person that we, we are sending officers to? Do we have a slew of professionals that we can send an officer to to get evaluated? Um, can you explain the steps a little bit further on that one? Absolutely. Uh, every, first of all, obviously every case is different, but there's a couple of ripples to that. So when we talk about officer support, um, one of those pieces is having an officer who's not involved come out for officer support because that officer, and, and there's a group of officers, unfortunately, who have been in officer involved critical incidents, have that officer, uninvolved officer come out on scene and link up with our involved officer. Not to run them through what happened, not to interview them, not to talk about the scene, but to care for them, um, to support them, let them know, hey, this is kind of how this is going to play out as far as BCI coming out, an interview, all those types of things down the line. So that's kind of the first piece of support, uh, mental health support. And then from there, I would say it is, we wanna make sure it's comfortable for the officer, the things that we are offering to them. But we will offer everything in our power to get them linked up to the appropriate resources. Again, whether that's through our city EOP, EAP, Maybe they have a clinician that they are comfortable with and we can facilitate that. Um, we wanna make sure that, that they have that comfort level. Cause again, at the end of the day, we're looking to maintain their wellness, maintain their overall mental health. So we do, I, I just say that to say, we do have multiple different resources that we could leverage in support of that officer, but we also want them to be comfortable with those resources and not just push them, push them onto them. You know, some people have to come to it at their own time. So uh, the last piece here, well, before I get to that, so I talked about a, a tabletop exercise and when we talk about tabletops. We are talking about uh, usually a group getting together and looking at a map on a table and putting cars around it, people around it, and brainstorming and running through a scenario. As we've talked about before, we, we find scenario-based training to be vitally important. This is just a, 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 bit, um, a bit more removed because it's, it's, uh, it's more conceptual um, when we talk about a tabletop. But Lieutenant Latanzi and I, I thank him for his leadership on this, um, worked with all of our corporals, our first line supervisors, all nine of them during a corporal uh, training in service day. And we did an officer involved shooting tabletop uh, to make sure that we were talking through this policy. It's, it's a nice two dimensional document, but without the understanding and, and a walkthrough and, and a dry run, if you will, um, it may not mean much. So we took the opportunity to walk each corporal through a mock officer involved shooting to make sure that all of our supervisors under, understand the impact of this and some of those operational pieces that we talked about and we talk about in the policy. So I just want to throw that out. Um, that was a great day. That was, that was really, um, it was a good training day for the corporals. And frankly, for me, I, I learned a lot too. I learned a lot about the corporals. I learned a lot about um, how this may play out operationally. So um, that, that was definitely beneficial for us. So when we get to, now we're, kind of, we're in the aftermath, or maybe we still have a scene running of that officer involved critical incident. And this is where, you know, we definitely would welcome this group's input um, as to what our public is expecting in messaging. And, and I don't mean the exact message, I mean an expectation perhaps of a, of a timeline, those types of things in messaging. And we've had internal discussions here um, from a command staff level, and then uh, Ms. Myers was involved in it as well, about information release, timeline of information release, community expectations and information release. Um, and so we kind of have a general idea, 
and it was a really good brainstorming session, but, but our thought would be providing the public with an initial update on that officer involved critical incident, in addition to any messaging that we would put out, um, any safety messaging that we would put out to make sure that the public is informed that there's an evolving incident. Once it's resolved, having that, you know, initial update to our public though would be beneficial. And then probably soon thereafter, again, I will keep it vague like that because we, you never know a time frame. Um, soon thereafter, scheduling a press, a press conference with the police department to be outward facing to our public with an update on what happened as much as we could inform them. And when I say as much as we can inform our public, I mean, once again, this is a coordination specifically with BCI. So we would have direct connectivity with them and we would not want to release or do anything that would compromise or could compromise that independent investigation. Um, and one of the pieces here, when you look at the last, the last uh, bullet point there is body cam footage release. You know, you know we, I'm sure you guys have seen this with several officer involved shooting, in, including several locally, regionally, excuse me, in this region. Um, when that gets released, how it gets released. We've had some of those discussions. We've researched some of the ways that other police departments have done it. And we do that in furtherance of being prepared. God forbid this were to happen in Dublin. So any questions on, that's really broad uh, public information piece, but any questions on that? So uh, I know you said that the timeline depends, but I'm gonna ask you about it anyway, um, because we live on in a social media world and People know things instantly without having all the facts, as we've seen many, many times. How are, how, I guess, and maybe this is more for the chief, how do you manage the public's expectation for information and also BCI's, uh, without compromising BCI's investigation, but, but making sure that if there are people who want to know what's going on, they have the ability to, to find, get that information if they need to. Asgir, that is a fantastic question. And, and part of the uh, impetus behind us having that collective discussion on a couple of occasions so far at a command staff level and to include uh, Ms. Myers as part of that conversation, because I think there are two really important and, and sometimes competing interests, uh, one of which is uh, the urgency and, and um, the need to know information first, and the other is to know to know it with accuracy. And so I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things in our reflection on how do we prepare ourselves as an organization, how we prepare a communi community to understand what our timeline might be, um, it's us looking at events that have occurred in other communities and how they have handled and shared information as not necessarily an absolute guide, but to understand what were the positives and, and, and benefits from sharing information in the way they have, and what are maybe some of the things that we have learned that we would do slightly differently if the situation were to occur in our community. I think for me, the most important thing is that we have accuracy and clarity on the information that we're providing, because if we are to rush out and just share details that we are not certain of or may change, I think you run the risk of undercutting the confidence you're trying to build by sharing the information at all. Um, and then second to that is making sure we share as much of the information as we possibly can at the point we decide to share it. And so when you think of these scenarios as a singular officer and a singular event, sometimes that presents itself as a, a simplistic uh, maybe calculus on how you're going to get that officer's body camera video out to the public. But we all know that the events that officers deal with and the work that we do is very dynamic in nature and involves in a community like Dublin, multiple officers responding to an event and sometimes multiple locations where that event or scene may cover. So the judge brought up an, a, an excellent example of what would fall under officer involved critical incidents if it were 
to involve vehicles. And if it were an officer crash, if that were an action an officer took, or if it was merely an, a, 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 um, the, a, a, the tragic end, and, and I don't say merely, but if it were the tragic end of an event and an officer was involved, but their actions were not exactly the, the contributory towards that outcome in the end, we would still wanna make sure we look at it to make sure we could with confidence turn to the public and say, we know everything we need to and we're providing you the details in the interest of transparency and accuracy in providing that information. Now, the, all of that is a lot of information I'm, I, I'm sharing because that's what we're taking into account as we try to frame ourselves what does that response look like in communication in the aftermath? And so we have taken a look at some examples and unfortunately there have been an abundance across the country and in a media age where everything is accessible, there are some templates in some organizations who probably have, again, more frequent occasion to share this type of event or information in their communities. So they have built platforms that make it maybe more simplistic for them to go ahead and be able to share the information and they publish their videos maybe to a YouTube channel. Again, we don't have that many requests for body uh, camera, uh, body worn camera information in our community, but we have an abundance of it. I don't know that it means that we would publish everything or what we would publish. So that's part of the discussion we're having with this group is to help inform us what does the community expect? We believe that in a high profile incident, it's important that we are very transparent and we share clearly and accurately the information we do have, but we would wanna make sure that that is informed by the nature of the event, the individuals involved in the event and the sensitivities for the people who are directly impacted by those events. The entire community is absolutely affected by something of this critical nature, but there are family members who uh, next of kin notifications that for us really take precedent in making sure that that communication happens directly first before they find out some way through social media by our presentation of information through some other means than direct notification. We can outrun the speed of social media sometimes in the way information travels in the current world, but we can provide, we can control what we're providing. It, again, it is just a balance of, again, timeliness, accuracy, and clarity of information uh, when we decide to put it out. That's a lot of answers that I don't know is exactly where we're at, but I wanted to share what we're taking into consideration as we build that. Absolutely. Um, that's that gives us all a better idea of what you are, what the fa what factors you're considering when you're doing this. And it's um, you know, it's hard to maintain public trust when these things happen. So having this discussion will go a long way if, God forbid, something like this ever happens here. I think that <clears throat> there's another stakeholder uh, as as I'm listening to the discussion that that um you know has to be brought into the equation and um so i'm i'm my mind goes to who's who's the legal the city's legal counsel and does the police department have a legal liaison from the city's legal department because you you can't step out <laughs> You can't step out giving out information without somebody taking the time to think about the legal ramifications of what may be about to occur. So, yes, it's great that we can offer some input, but from a practical standpoint, and I'm not asking that, you know, this information be divulged now, but the city city's legal team and if the department has a legal liaison those people have to be brought into the discussion before any of anything goes out 
Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Judge, and that is that is a resource that we do. Um, the, the the city has good um, representation that we work with regularly, uh, and and uh, from a police perspective, a good point of contact that we lean into uh, to make sure that our policies are informed. And uh, as it relates to the release of information, uh, uh, Director Somerville shared a little bit today uh, about some of the legal resources we have that inform public records. And what we're talking about ultimately is the release of public records as part of information awareness on a critical incident to the public and we would lean into those same resources to help inform our conversations and discussion on timeline the amount of information and how we are sharing information uh, and that is consistent with how we have handled other high profile critical incidents where uh, it, when they relate to crime we're investigating where we are the investigating agency we lean into that to that advice as well just to make sure we're on the right page we're on the um, practical page and also meeting these are public records, so when the public asks for them, you know, we have to figure out how we satisfy that request, also with balancing all those other interests. And I'd ask uh, Director uh, Somerville if there's anything else that I missed. Um, you know, I just want to make sure I, you know, and Lieutenant Latanzi probably has the most frequent contact as it relates to policy discussions and considerations from a legal perspective with our liaison uh, from the city. No, I'd say you hit the nail right on the head, Chief. They always seem to say that, but uh, later we find out the truth. I say, well, this is the this is what you should have <laughs> offered this next time in the meeting. No, I appreciate I appreciate the support. Can I ask one other question while we're in this subject matter, and it, and it's you know another worst case type of scenario, but is there a different uh, policy? that relates to a scenario if an officer goes down? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, there, there is a line of uh, duty death policy. Again, another heavy discussion we undertook over the last several years. And if we would, uh, if you would permit us to have that discussion and awareness um, with you as part of a future discussion, I would love uh, for Lieutenant Latanzi to walk through the work he did in putting that policy together. Uh, he and Lieutenant Tabernick as well um, uh, in, in formulating that policy for us, uh, because I will tell you uh, the discussion we had tonight, we, we can continue to have and it's very important for us to continue to have. Um, because we will we will want to make sure that we are clear with the public on what we're doing, why we're doing it and what to expect. Um, but the event you just mentioned is one that keeps us up at night too. Um, losing a member of this organization uh, it is an absolute nightmare for us. And it, it is one of those occasions where we would lean on uh, the community and this group to help us uh, think through how we navigate that as well. But we do have a policy in place that helps guide our at least initial response and activities uh, in, the, uh, um, in, in the God forbid occasion where we were to lose a member in the line of duty. Uh, I'm thank you for sharing that. I'm I'm glad to know that. And um, um you know that's certainly something that as a as a CAC we should probably discuss. It may might it may not be this iteration of the CAC that that gets into that. Uh, but I think it's important that we all know that there is a, a different policy that's out there uh and, and it probably needs attention. So thank you. Uh, Judge, this is Imran. Can I ask a real quick question? A uh, little bit relevant, but a little bit off topic as well. Uh, Chief, the Dublin Police Department, is it part of a certain uh, you know, fraternity of police or is it there like uh, one fraternity of police for the entire central Ohio? I mean, how does that kind of membership or umbrella works out if you can shed some light on that? Yeah, that's a great question, Ron, uh, and it is related because uh, Lieutenant Tabernick mentioned it as part of our conversation and building or, or uh, um, amending uh, this policy on officer involved critical incident. So the Dublin police force, uh, the officers who are represented uh, and who are uh, part of the contract, the uh, supervisors and officers are represented by the FOP Lodge 9, Capital City Lodge 9, um, which is uh, also represents several of the other suburban agencies and Columbus and Franklin County in this area. Uh, so for our members in uh, NREC, they are represented by the FOP 
OLC. So they are they are also represented as a labor union, um, and that representation really relates to their membership as part of that that labor union. But it's FOP uh, Lodge Nine and FOP OLC for our agency. I appreciate it. Thanks. Judge, I just want to thank uh, Lieutenant Tabernick. He did some excellent work in bringing uh, members of our organization together and then bringing outside resources and then reaching out to agencies who have unfortunately um, gone through more experience than we ever hope to have here to help inform this policy. But he did some excellent work and, and thank you again for some time tonight uh, for us to be able to share. Again, I don't expect all the questions to arise to the top right now. This is again, awareness. And we hope that if you have any questions, um, you please raise those to us so we can continue to have our policies informed by the expectations um, from the public as well. And judge the last as we're reaching 730 tonight, the last bullet point we have on our agenda tonight, actually we just held as a placeholder because unfortunately, while we had intended initially to have uh, some members come, we weren't able to arrange the schedule uh, exactly yet to do so. And it may be advantageous as we're still building the peer support program, but I'd ask Lieutenant Tabernick just to give a little overview and certainly some thanks and gratitude to a member of our advisory committee for helping us uh, with that development as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Chief. Judge, if I could get five minutes, I'll try to keep it to that. But this is something that uh, is really exciting for our agency, exciting for me, exciting for Chief, Lieutenant Latanzi, Director Somerville. Um, so uh, as kind of some background, uh, those of you that are familiar with the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, officer wellness and safety was actually the sixth pillar that they named um, for organizations to address in furtherance of building trust. Uh, with their community and moving forward into what will be the future of policing. So this was the sixth pillar, um, which is a very large reason that we found it to be vitally important. Um, and, and I will read just verbatim our mission statement involving our entire wellness approach or initiative. And it it is to improve and enhance the quality of life and job enrichment for all of our members, so sworn and civilian, our NREC members, our records members, um, of the Dublin Police Department utilizing a holistic approach. The initiative strives to help to change the culture of the organization regarding the multifacets of mental health, wellness, and resiliency. In turn, our, member, our members will provide the highest level of service on each interaction with the community and other law enforcement stakeholders. So that, that last piece being the most vitally important and everything leading to that as, a, as an organization that is very, very service driven. So in furtherance of this initiative, we did form a wellness steering committee. I won't get too involved in that, but this is another example of a cross section of our organization relying on our fantastic members to provide their expertise, their experience, um, anecdotal or otherwise, uh, to this group so that, uh, so that we have a holistic approach in the end. And when I talk about wellness, some of the buckets that we're talking about here are emotional wellness, financial wellness, occupational wellness, physical wellness, social wellness, both internally and externally, um, and spiritual wellness. So that's what we're looking at for a holistic approach. Um, it's important to note, we do have a lot of connectivity with other organizations, especially in central Ohio, who are driving towards this same goal of organizational resiliency, member resiliency, to provide the highest level of service to the public. Um, so uh, I've gotten a lot of my information from other people to include one of our committee members here, uh, Ms. Ortega, and I'll get to that in, in just a second. Um, one of the exciting pieces that we have already accomplished is our partnership with the STAR app. So it's an app on, on your, um, your iPhone or Android device, and it, in sum, provides resources um, and support to our members on their own time. So there's, there's all, all types of mental health resources, um, everything from meditation, relaxation, um, ability to contact uh, retired members who were police officers to talk through some things with them, ability to contact our newest uh, peer support members. Again, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and, and just as a little background on the STAR app, it is a evidence-based app 
in collaboration with Ohio State University and Dr. Ken Yeager. So that's kind of our, our connectivity to the app. Um, and we find it vitally important to provide additional resources, once again, for our members to come to on their own time um, in furtherance of resiliency and then ultimately service to our public. So um, there's several other things that we can get to, and I'm sure we'll get to them at a later date, but this is just an intro. The peer support team is something that was just created. Uh, we have all three shifts represented and two of our three uh, units, our specialized units represented. So once again, a lot of representation to provide support to their peers. And that, that includes NREC as well. Um, so we have a few dispatchers on that peer support team. We're building it from the ground up, again, with a lot of help from some area partners. Uh, we just did those, did those panel interviews for those members three weeks ago now, and we had Ms. Ortega as part of that. Uh, and I would just say that, that I learned an awful lot as a panelist from not only the people, the applicants, uh, the members who were interviewing, but also my fellow panelists who have way more experience than, than I do in, in, in this piece. Um, once again, all driving towards the same goal. So that was, um, that was fantastic for us. Uh, and the last thing I would leave with that I'm sure we will get to at some point, um, Lieutenant Latanzi is, is uh, coordinating a suicide prevention town hall. So this is once again in our overall wellness approach and it's a city town hall. Uh, that will happen in September. Again, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to that, but it felt like a good um, thing to at least throw out there for consumption as part of our overall wellness. So once again, something very exciting. Thank you, Susan, very much for helping me through that and helping um, our agency through that. And I'm sure we'll talk about uh, that a little more. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Lieutenant. And Susan, I always, when they, when they um, bring you up in the work that you're doing, I'm always curious uh, to hear any report or feedback that you think, would think would be important for the uh, community partners to hear. Just, you know, if, if it's relationship you know we're talking about we're talking about bridge building a lot or i do anyway but relationship building and <clears throat> how if at all that you see that you know being a, a part of an advisory committee like this is is helpful not only to what you do professionally but helpful to the to the community Absolutely. Thank you, Judge. I think, well, first I want to say thank you to the department for inviting me to be a part of that. It was an, an extreme honor. And one thing that kept running through my head while meeting um, as part of the panel interview with the, the folks interviewing is just the level of commitment that these men and women bring to everything that they're trying to do in serving the Dublin community. Um, you know, not only wanting to make sure they serve community members, but also their team so that they, every single one of them was like, we need to be well so we can do do well for the community. And I'm, and that just makes me excited for the Dublin community. I think um, I absolutely agree with the Lieutenant. It was very beneficial, I think, even as a panelist to hear the other perspectives as well from um, the other folks who were represented on the panel. Um, just the Dublin, Department is doing, from my perspective, a really nice job reaching out to folks who have established teams and to other departments who are still also trying to grow their teams to kind of learn, you know, get those lessons learned. Um, everyone is open to being honest about what works, what doesn't work. Um, I think one of the things that I heard to, to your specific question, maybe judge is um, as a committee and then hopefully as a community, because the sworn officers and, and the civilian staff have such a commitment to wanting to serve the community. Um, and I don't have a, a perfect fix it answer tonight, but 
trying to figure out how we can continue to build the, that connectedness to the diverse communities within Dublin for every officer, you know, not just community liaisons or SROs or things like that, but for every officer um, and civilian staff, because I think that will go a long way to both ways by directionally um, help the department feel like they are connected and really understand the communities they're supporting, but also help the communities understand um, the officers as well. So that's that's kind of my two cents right now, but it was it's a phenomenal experience and, and process and I applaud the department for being so thoughtful about how they're going about this and how they will continue to support the members of the support team as they're supporting their fellow members. Thank you, Susan. And, you know, of course, when we well. I could, I could, I could probably wax on for a long time too, and I don't want to do that because of the hour. But I certainly appreciate um, the different ways that the committee is finding ways to be uh, effective in building bridges, and I, I really hope that when it's all said and done. <clears throat> Uh, council will find value in this in this advisory committee because there's a lot of a lot of good work and a lot of uh, connectivity and a lot of positive relationship building that that uh, is coming out of this. So um, we did. Thank you everybody for your presentations, lieutenants, both of you all um, really good jobs tonight. Um, we had a current event uh, section that we passed on so that we could get through um, the rest of the agenda. And unless there is something uh, that someone specifically wants to address in a current event, um, I would I would say that we had a very productive meeting, um, and I I don't see the need to go into anything in addition to uh, the subject matters that we uh, broached and covered tonight. So, if anybody does want to say something, I I will give you. Uh, two minutes as the the chair to get your current event uh, discussion out or comments out. I have I one. I think we have to celebrate someone's graduation. And the chief, would you like to share your good news with everyone? What? The chief has news? Yes, and it's a good current event. I think it should be celebrated. I thought we were going to celebrate <laughs> Cam again. I didn't realize it was coming in this direction. Um, so I, I finished. I will hit send um, shortly after the meeting on the last piece of, of um, correspondence for uh, finishing my MBA through Tiffin University. So after, <laughs> after four years of a lot of evenings and weekends here at the Justice Center, um, and, and a lot of support from my family and from everybody uh, who is here with me at the uh, at the police department. I will be finally finished with that, and and uh, and very grateful for the experience, and certainly uh, looking forward to horizons on how I continue to push myself in the future too. But thank you very much. I appreciate that acknowledgement. Very good. Congratulations, for sure. And Aj Murray, thank you for bringing congratulations, that. Chief. I can't imagine a higher note to go out on, so um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting of the CAC. I move, I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Yes, a second. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, stay safe, uh, be well, and um, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Good night. Have a good evening.